Today in News Tech, a look at hybrid newsrooms and how to integrate video into your reporting. The newspaper industry faces assault on public notices. And finally, a product review of the WordPress block editor. Chris, you've been following an article from Reuters on some of the innovations that they're anticipating for the next year. Is that right? Yes, it's a pretty large article on trends in journalistic publishing Mm -hmm. over the entire year, just trends they see building not only upon things that we've been dealing with during the pandemic, but as kind of we're hoping to see a a post-pandemic thing. Where are people putting money? Where are they putting resources? Uh, What are the types of things that they would like to feature Right. In order to continue growing. So I'm going right. to share my screen real quick and jump back to the articles that I've been uh, digging up with these. All right. So I've been making a series, and this is the third part in the series uh, on this particular article, Journalism, Media, and Technology Trends and Predictions for 2022. And we, I was just kind of going through their executive summary down here uh, to kind of break this up into sections since it is such an in-depth article. And where we got to last time was we were talking a little bit about audio content and video content, Mm. and that started to lead into a conversation about what types of video content is going to be the trending type in the future. And Terry brought up a good point about having community meetings that are either hosted by or attended by the editorial staff, and that I asked her to hold on to that thought because that is one of the first points that comes up in section three, which is called the practice of journalism, hybrid newsrooms, generational change, and new agendas. And specifically, it is the hybrid newsroom point that I thought would be most important to focus on because it is exactly what Terry was bringing up, is with less people in the office, with more people working at home, what can you now do with that office space? Mm. What can, can you bring in the community into the newsroom itself to have a community newsroom discussion on types of content, types of content delivery? Very and interesting. The exact point here is with fewer staff in the office, some right. publishers have been looking to reuse the space. And one of the gains here, this is the the a bit of a data chart here is what have what has been the result of this hybrid working environment what's been better and what's been worse and that's summarized in this chart here of yes efficiency has gone up maybe employee well-being has gone up because they're at home with their kids and whatnot but you can also see where things are suffering in collaboration creativity and communication where those swing in the exact opposite direction mm-hmm. so they're trying to come up with ways of seeing how these effects can maybe to a certain degree be embraced or to a certain degree accommodated now that it seems to be a bit more of a new normal. So I thought I'd turn it over to anyone who wants to talk about the ways that some of our customers have been employing some of these community gatherings. Have they just been attending Uh, civic meetings and then reporting back on that, maybe with an audio blog or a little video if that's allowed in the filming or any of the other ways that uh, any of the customers that we have have started to kind of create these getting back in touch moments with the readers since everybody's been so isolated for so long. It's a good question. Example that comes to mind right away is the Wilson County News. And we've talked about them before doing this, but they've got you know, the Wilson County News uh, weekly live Facebook show. So they're using Facebook as their primary platform. And they've been doing this for a while, really since the beginning of the shutdown, at least, if not before. They are bringing in people from the community, advertisers often, also just different business owners, just hearing firsthand from them. It's a really interesting approach to it. It's not a lot of preparation required. I don't know exactly what kind of prep they do, but not a lot of production involved. Let's say that because they can sit down with a list of questions 
film it and broadcast it at the same time, you know, because they're using the live function. They have just kind of committed to that live feel with these videos. It's not an overproduced video and it's it's a long form discussion. I've seen that definitely. And they're, like I said, bringing people right into like the Wilson County break room there, making it a, a more personal way of telling the news. You know, it's not just coming across yeah. your desk as a printed sheet of paper where you don't even know what the people look like anymore, the, the way it used to be. Now it's, you see them talking, you hear their voice, kind of get to know these journalists even in better. And then also the subjects of the interviews, you know, hearing from local business owners, it's just, it's creating a community that's really only possible with this kind of technology. You, know, you could have these events in person, but you know, I, I think they're just going to get much further reach doing this on a platform like Facebook Live. Also something that you could easily do through Zoom if you wanted to really own that content and not distribute it for free on social media. You just use a Zoom meeting and you know just promote that event through your newsletter or on your website. Any other examples that we've seen of people taking advantage of this hybrid work environment? We have two. I have um, the Mountaineer. Uh, She does uh, a podcast where she can interview local bands and local businesses that are opening up in the area. She's also had public officials uh, talking about road work and um, public utilities that are going to be replaced. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is... um, a Collinwood Observer, since he doesn't have a staff, he relies on the community to provide the articles, which I think is a really clever approach. Yeah, absolutely. He was one of the first to really build out that whole submission platform so that people can sign up for a free writer account on the website, and then they could submit articles for him to review and ultimately for him to publish. But yeah, Mountaineer, definitely innovative publisher there with the podcast. Just kind of embracing these different multimedia formats. We've been talking about this for a long time, but it's not as intimidating as it might seem at first. You just do it a couple of times. And if you just get in the habit of doing it, I think you'll start to see people turn up for it and you can get even more out of it as you go. Uh, These types of things don't always have a huge audience when you start, but if you just kind of make it part of your process and you can create something of value out of it, even if there's not many people attending, I think that's a good use of time. That's kind of what we're doing with office hours, creating video tutorials while we're brainstorming as a group. Any other comments on this article? We've listed a couple of our our personal uh, customer anecdotes. I just wanted to briefly scroll through and because there's a couple of of tips here. Great. Yes. Oh, good some of these meetings. Right. So um, in, if, if you're doing just an interview or something like that, what these are focusing more on is actually when it's hybrid, you've got some people who are there via maybe a Zoom and they're on a big screen. I'll scroll down. There's a really nice pic of this. So you've got your Zoom visitors. You've got personal video uh, visitors. Mm-hmm. You've got Zoom visitors. You've got in-person vid- visitors. And then you've got your panelists, i.e. this could be uh, your editorial team, and they're talking about whatever kinds of things that they would like to talk about. I'm right. guessing, and, and here it's like a think in with, if you could imagine going back to some kind of civic thing, like how do we solve the pothole issue or, or, right. or the new grocery store opening, you know, some of those civic minded things. Those are the kind of things that I think could really lend themselves well. And then because I did take a peek at the next topic, this is also where something like public notice civic duty things can also come to bear where you can get more engagement and discussion rather than just uh, necessarily what is required of, of just printing out the legalese of, of every right. legal notice. There can be some some zoning issues and things that can be talked about and that can then go into some coverage to give context to the public notices and things that are uh, right. being put in the paper. Yeah, let me just add on to that in terms of how to run these meetings the first thing before you go into the meeting is going to be, what are we going to talk about? And so a a great source of topics would be probably your stats program. Again, to go back to your stats website, stats.ourhometown.com, look at the most popular article that month or that week, and then use that as your deciding force. You know, what is uh, the thing that people want to hear about or 
What can we elaborate on? You know, and that's obviously one of many decision factors. Maybe there's some articles that need to be elaborated on in a video format, but they maybe didn't get the same traction on the website. So there's different ways to look at it, but that was just something I was reading earlier about the Twitter spaces, how a lot of publishers are using that to amplify articles that are already doing well and to elaborate on them in this different media format. I think that's all I had on the, on this point about the hybrid thing. I'm sure that it will right. come back uh, as we kind of find more ways of helping our customers engage maybe in this right. way. Right. One of the biggest benefits, I think, of using video or adding video to your site is it doesn't take up as much space as an article would. And you also get to ask questions that people want to want to hear, you know, your readers want to know, okay, what are you doing about this? You can directly ask those things. It's kind of like as a reporter, you would ask your panel certain things, but without a pen and paper. But Newport this week has videos of their town hall meetings and that sort of thing that they post on a regular basis. Interesting. So they post that on YouTube and then they can embed it either in a block right. article or just embed it right on the homepage. Right. Right. And they're I mean, there. You know, they're archived. Yeah. It's another tool in your toolbox. You know, there's some stories that are going to you know, be more effective being written that you're going to really want to craft the narrative and, you know, use all your writing skills. But sometimes it's just easier to capture an event with video. It is because you got the whole like you said, the personal level right. involved because now you're looking at body language too. Right. Body language says a lot that you right. can't convey in an article. And the nice thing is that the technology has gotten to the point where it's very easy to use this stuff. If you've got YouTube mobile app, then you could record a school board meeting on your phone and then just upload it directly from the phone to YouTube and grab that embeddable link and then put it on the website. Ultimately, it is about getting traffic to the website and getting subscribers. So we don't want to just put it on YouTube. I, ideally, YouTube would be the place that we host it. And then it's prominently featured on the homepage. Or if you wanted to embed a link on, if you're going to post it on Facebook, the way to do it would probably be to embed the YouTube link on the article and then share that article link on Facebook rather than embedding the video on Facebook. You know, it's just one extra step that the reader would have to take. I think also taking that route with mm -hmm. the video conferencing or meetings and things like that addresses a portion of the collaboration in the graph that Christopher showed here. Mm. Uh, the collaboration, creativity, and communication where things seem to be falling off the edge there. You're right. certain to have some brainstorming come out of these video calls. When you've gone from in person to like text messaging, there's so much loss. There's all this body language that you lose. People might be trying to say something, but they can't quite get their a word in, you know, because the text message is going so fast. If you're like a Slack user or something like that, audio is just a, another dimension to add to that. Matt, I had follow up really to build upon the discussion that you guys were just having on video. And I just wanted to point out that Video is almost kind of a built-in requirement of doing the hybrid newsroom as it is. And so one of the points mm -hmm. here is they're saying that employees coming into the office maybe three days a week, two right. days a week from home, and then basically that allows you to open up that space. And if you can have basically what would have been a talking head only Zoom call, you can have a few leaders come in or a few business people come in who are talking about some maybe a zoning topic or something like that. You have right. it as a smaller meeting, but it's still a hybrid because you do have people there live. The call still going out to those who can't attend, but it, it kind of engages in a different way because not everybody's just a box on a screen. Right. You, know, you have some, yep. some of that body, uh, body language and interaction in these right. hybrid things, even if it's just with 10 people and some panelists, and then everybody else is kind of just checking it out on one of the live uh, streaming platforms. You know, as, as local newspapers, we've got that real estate in the community. It's oftentimes right on the main street there on a, a nice short little village like you know, the town I grew up in is what I'm picturing where all the local businesses, town hall, police department, local newspaper are, you know, within a block of each other. So really does lend itself to gathering people and it's never really been used that way. It's interesting how 
this disruption could lead to this type of thing starting to happen for the first time. Very cool. I wanted to hear from Terry because she's always keeping an eye out. I feel like for these articles, you know, we are keeping an eye out for the technical developments in the industry, but we are also really focused on the core revenue streams for our customers and legal notices, public notices have been a core revenue stream for years, despite classifieds, unfortunately, many of them moving over to Craigslist. That's kind of been an unregulated thing. Public notices, legal notices have been reinforced through the law, right, Terry? It's right. a law that they have to put it in a print newspaper. So why don't you give us a little bit more background on that and tell us about this latest development? Yeah, I thought you might be interested in, in the history of this. I mean, we're all yeah. accustomed to seeing public notices in newspapers, and maybe we kind of unconsciously figure that it it's required somehow um, if you've never been involved with your community on a government level as far as meetings and things like that. But this came out yesterday in Publisher Insider. Public notices, also known as legal notices, they, they might be just listed as notices. They are under assault. They have been for quite a few years now. We've had a few publishers with that have been in the trenches with litigation and that sort of thing. And I would just like to add right now that if your paper isn't part of a newspaper association, you really need to consider that because newspaper associations are your greatest advocate when it comes to this type of thing. All right, I just want to add on to that. A lot of these associations have statewide public notice sites too, right? We saw a couple of examples yeah. of that. Correct. So but anytime I, anything is in legislation, like it is right now, right. and it has been for the past couple of years, your newspaper associations do have representatives at these things and they're fighting on your behalf. It says, but in recent days, they've come under assault, meaning public notices in print editions have come under assault with at least five state legislators moving to relax requirements that municipal and state governments post public notices in local newspapers. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to move the requirement of posting in local newspapers to posting on a government website. There's two things here. First of all, government accountability. And newspapers have long been the torchbearers of government accountability. If a government is posting on their own website, who's holding them accountable? How do we know? The second thing is accessibility. Not everyone has access to the web. It's not right in your face. I mean, even if you right. don't have a dollar fifty to go and pick up your newspaper, oftentimes you can go to the stand and look at it and put it back down. Two really interesting points. Broadly speaking, the news deserts that are creeping up on us, you mentioned accountability. I mean, this is what starts to happen. If you don't have an independent party that mm -hmm. is a established, verified publication in the area, you know, you could just have these fly-by-nights pop up that claim to be you know, a public notice website. They don't really have any real tie to the community. It's, it's kind of the same problems that you see with fake news pages showing up on Facebook. Anyone can start a fake news website and post right. their opinions there. But this is something that's tied into just the fabric of the community by requiring the newspaper to be... That's why you're a newspaper of record. The, yeah, the newspaper every, of record, right. Every exactly. community, whether it's a village, a town, a city, even counties, have a newspaper of record for, specifically for this purpose of posting public notices. One of those things that I didn't see if it was mentioned, but it's also an issue of transparency too, is when government entities post bids for contracts. Important thing for local business people to be aware of to make sure that there's nothing underhanded going on. Mm -hmm. It's completely accessible to anyone who wants to check and see who's bidding, right. all those kind of things. Those public transparency issues are paramount. Most often, Public notices have to do with changes in the community or transactions, and changes in the community would be zoning laws, things like that, where, or, or variances, where the public has to have a certain amount of notification before any changes are made. They have to be made aware of this, and they have to have an opportunity for input. And then transactions, like Christopher mentioned, selling off your old town salt truck, you need to publicly post that and not give preference to personal friends, 
or you know business associates and that sort of thing. Those mm-hmm. things have to be public. The public right. has to have equal access to them. To me, pretty clearly, just about the revenue and like right. you know saving money. That they don't want to have to pay the newspaper to do this anymore. But when it's a public notice coming from the town hall, then that's really taxpayer dollars that are going to the newspaper. It's kind of a nice setup because the funding is coming from the public and they're serving the public. That's right. And the argument is, is that if it's hosted on a government website, which is already paid for by the taxpayers, it would be posted without additional charges. However, your taxpayers are paying for public notices to be published in a print edition. So now what happens when you take that away from them? I'm a taxpayer. I expect to see public notices in a print paper. And also that's another source of revenue loss for the local newspaper. If that's right, exactly. It's a huge revenue loss. That's the issue here. So let's just try to look for a solutions to this. You know, we're trying to do solutions journalism here on Today in News Tech. Now, one thing that you mentioned that you can do to get involved is to join your state association and see what yes. kind of things they're doing, because this is all happening on the state level. We've seen right. some things, I think, here in Nevada, it mentions, in Florida. And it that, seems to be a bipartisan thing, you know, in this age of partisanship. This mm-hmm. seems to be a bipartisan thing. And the people that are arguing for moving to a web-only public notices platform, they've got arguments. And it's really, really hard to fight those arguments. If, if that's what it is, I still feel like newspapers have an advantage because even if this whole print requirement went away, they've got the advantage and like kind of the inside track to becoming the digital website of record. I think publishers have that desire and, and that ethic background where they would probably publish for nothing because mm-hmm. they consider themselves stewards to their community of, of all this information. So the big thing is, is the loss of revenue. A number of things that publishers could do to try to hold on to that revenue, though, if they create a page on their website for public notices so that people could come in, place their notice on the website, and then also have the option for it to appear in print and make that all one interface just make it as simple as possible and then maybe just require it. So if you want to be on the website, then you know, you've know you got to take this print ad as well. I think a lot of people have taken that approach with just advertising in general. So that might work here for public notices in general. The tools are definitely on WordPress for creating a section like this. If it did come down to the point where it was decoupled from print, the newspaper could still hang on to this revenue in a digital only format, if nothing else, to keep it away from becoming all centralized under one government right. branch. This is an inevitable consequence, I think, of technology moving forward. So it's just a question of how much we can hold on and how we can adapt to continue to serve the community in vital roles. Of- I just had a really far out thought. I mean, what if mm-hmm. the whole web just crashed? Seriously. Right. <laughs> I mean, what if? Yeah. You, at least now you still have a print edition, or we go back to mailing notices to the town hall doors. It's important to keep government accountable for all things. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. All right. So once we've got the block editor pulled up, you can see just your standard layout here. I'm just going to pull an article that's already on the site over here. So let's pull our title. That just copies right in. Next, here's where you can type your body. This is also where blocks will go. So let's just go ahead and copy this text and I can show how it automatically breaks each paragraph up into different blocks. So now each of these sections is its own block. So basically whenever you hit enter in a paragraph section, it's gonna section that out. And that just makes it a little easier to compartmentalize, to edit, and also say I want to move this text around. I just hit the arrow. And it's just a little more visual way of editing. And also, let's say we want to add an image in between these two paragraphs. All I've got to do is hit the plus button to add a block and go into images. And then I'm going to pull one from the media library that's already in here. 
Let's just pull the first one I find. And there, now we have the image separating these two paragraphs. So that's the nice thing about the block editor. It's really simple. You don't have to keep bouncing back and forth between a menu. Everything kind of just flows straight down the page as you write it. Now, if you need to go through and edit image settings, these are gonna pop up on this column. Once again, that's the advantage here is you don't have to go all the way to the bottom of the screen to get to half of these settings. So as you're editing here, you can tweak things along the side. So if I click away from any of the blocks, we're gonna get our standard settings, which has your publication settings. So that's where you can set the status, publish an article. If we need to assign a category to it, which is something that you'll need to do to get it to actually show up on the page, it will be in this column here. Now, if we wanna put it behind a paywall, here's where you determine the paywall term. Here's where you can add a featured image. The excerpt should automatically generate as you write your article, but if you would like to type an excerpt, that's where you can do that. Uh, here are audio article settings. If you have audio articles turned on, uh, here is the option I always like to point out. If this is an urgent news story and you need to make sure all your readers get it, this broadcast option will send an email blast out to everyone on your subscriber list. Here is where you assign this article to a paywall. And here's where you set the edition, which is also very important to do along with categories. Today in News Tech, the podcast covering innovation in digital journalism. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe on YouTube or any of your favorite podcast apps. We'll see you tomorrow. At our hometown, we help newspapers build WordPress websites, design native apps, and develop digital subscription models. If you are interested in a free prototype of your publication on WordPress, go to ourhometown.com and click the Contact Us button.